before we start to go into block ciphers and, and, uh, and the main example of the block cipher death, we'll just recap on what we know, or some parts of what we know from classical ciphers. We went through several example, very simple ciphers, starting from 2,000 years old, the Caesar cipher, and they were transposition techniques. We, sorry, wrong way around, substitution techniques. We substitute one element with another. We use English characters. Uh, so we were substituting a H with a J, for example. And then there were transposition techniques where we take the plain text set of characters and rearrange them, transpose. We change the position of the characters. Uh, did we finish? Actually, I think we've got, we can go back to that one last transposition techniques, we got to rail fence. Oh, we still have one more thing to do. We got through some examples of the two transposition techniques, just two basic ones. Tran rail fence, where we write the plain text in a set of rows, writing the first letter in the first row, the second letter in the second row, and so on. So that the key, in fact, was the depth, the number of rows. And then we finish with an example of rows columns transposition, where, again, we write our plain text in rows. And then the key determines which columns we read first to get our plain text. Sorry, to get our cipher text. So we, we write security and cryptography in a set of rows. And then the key is a set of integers that says, the second column is read first, because the one is in the second position of the key. The fifth column is read second, and we read column by column to get our ciphertext. So we had an example of that. Both of them simply rearrange the letters. This, tries to, this example tries to illustrate the case that when we repeatedly apply the same algorithm, we can improve the security of the resulting ciphertext. And this simple case uses a rows column cipher. So we're not doing it on the, well, I've got the answers here. We start with some plain text. Attack postponed until 2 a.m. X, Y, Z. The X, Y, Z we're going to use to, to, to pad out. To, so we've got a, a, a correct number of characters. Because our key, 4312567, tells us that we're going to have to write this plain text in seven columns. And with seven columns, I think the, if you count the characters, how many are there? Anyone count for me? How many characters? 28, I think, I hope so. How many characters in the plain text? Yeah, 28 characters. We'll see here. I've got numbers. Okay. 28 characters, seven columns. So we write our plain text in four rows 28 divided by 7. And then, so attack post, so the first seven letters. And in the first row, the next seven letters in the second row, and so on. And then to get the cipher text, we read the third column, because the one in the key is in the third position. Read the third column, so down, and that produces TTNA. So if you looked at the third column, you'll see TTNA under each other. And then we read the fourth column, because that's where the two is in the fourth position. And we'd get this cipher text. So you can try that in your own time. We're not going through it now. What we show, and we'll do it again in a moment, but what we show here is, let's not worry about the individual letters. Let's look at the ordering and see how the transposition rearranges the le these letters and see the patterns. Let's say we number these 28 letters from 1 through to 28. And I can't fit it all on one line, so I've wrapped it across two lines. So. A, T, T, A, C, K, P, and so on. That's how we interpret. So 1, 2, 3, 28. Z is 
character 28 in our plain text. So just number them 1 through to 28. And we get these. Then we apply the rows columns transposition cipher and we get this cipher text. But remember transposition, transposition we just rearrange. So if we follow where do the letters end up? Where does the first letter A end up in the cipher text? That's what this set of numbers tell us. The first letter, 0, 1 here, ends up in which position? It's here, the 13th letter. I think it's this A here. If you follow through the cipher, you'll see that this A ends up here. Or if we look at it numbers, the first letter in the plain text ends up in the 13th position in the cipher text after the uh, rearrangement, after the transposition. The third letter in the plain text, which was a T, ends up in the first position of the cipher text. Actually moves to here when we apply this algorithm. So that's all these numbers are showing us. How did we rearrange them? Because we want to do some analysis and see how good this rearrangement, this transposition is. So if we start with some plain text, after applying our cipher we get this arrangement of the letters. Now look at these numbers. On, your, on the screen, on the printout in front of you, look at this set of numbers. What pattern do you see? Looking at this set of numbers, describe the pattern you see. If you, just tell me if you see any pattern. If so, what is the pattern? Just look at the numbers. Yeah. I will check that later, okay? All right, thank you. Someone made a point that maybe there's a mistake in one of these, uh, and you good chance of being correct. Uh, there may be a, uh, a mistake in one of these, but we'll survive with this mistake until later, okay? I don't know. Uh, but I think it won't make any difference. Maybe one, one letter has shifted, but I'll check that later. looking at the, coming back to these numbers, this is, let's say it's all correct, this is the output uh, after the first encryption. What pattern do you see in these numbers? Just looking at the numbers. Does anyone see a pattern? So look at those 28 numbers. Do you see some ordering of the numbers that makes some uh, some pattern makes some sense, or is it all random? These numbers, random? What's the pattern we see? What do you see there? Plus seven. Hmm? Plus seven. Okay. Look at the numbers. Easy. I, I don't ask complex questions, okay? Look at these numbers. Three. 10, 17, 24. There's a difference of 7 between these four numbers, just incrementing. All right, 24 to 4. Oh, that's strange. That's not a difference of 7. But 4, 11, 18, 25, a difference of 7. Okay. If I ask you, does this sequence of numbers look random? Yes or no? Hands up for yes. Do they look random? Do they look random, this sequence of numbers? If I tell you, here's a random sequence, 3, 4, 3, 10, 17, 24, I think you'll start to see a pattern. A random sequence should not have any pattern. There should be no structure in a random sequence. This has some structure that we can obviously see. 4, 11, 18, 25, a difference of 7. 2, 9, 16, 23, a difference of 7. So every four digits, every four numbers, have a difference of seven. Why? Well, the way that the rows column works in that we have seven columns, and every four numbers, because we had 28 characters, seven columns, groups of four. The point is, when we apply a cipher, we take some structured plain text, we'd like to get random looking cipher text. 
ciphertext should be hard to work out what the plain text is. So it should be, we say, simply random looking. This is obviously not random. We can easily see the pattern. So it's not very secure, this, this cipher on its own. But if we take this ciphertext and apply the exact same cipher with the same key again on the ciphertext, we, and you can check, we get this ciphertext as an output. And instead of looking at the letters, we look at where do the original plain text letters end up. After the first transposition, the first letter ended up in the 13th position. But after the second application of our cipher, the first letter ends up in wherever, the 20 something position. Here. Similar, the third letter of plain text, the T, after the first time we applied the cipher, went to the first position of the output. But then we apply the cipher again on this, and that third letter moves to here, the 13th position. Now look at these numbers. Sequence of numbers, 17, 9, 5, 27, 24. Tell me the pattern you see. So in the, in the previous sequence, we saw this difference of 7. What do you see in the next sequence? Try and find it. Look at those numbers at the bottom of the slide and see what pattern you see between the, the numbers, if, if any. These ones. Of course, I think you'll quickly see our difference of 7 has disappeared. We don't have a difference of 7 between uh, the neighbour numbers. 17 down to 9, some difference of 8, down to 5, minus 4, but up to 27 plus 12. Okay, there's uh, some differences in how they differ between those numbers. Anyone else? Anyone want to guess? Not so obvious to see any pattern in these numbers. To me, and I hopefully to most of you that are following, these sequence of numbers look more random than this sequence of numbers. This one we can see a pattern, plus 7, plus 7, plus 7 and then plus 777. Seven, seven. In this one, well, there's no similar pattern, no obvious pattern at least. They're going down and then up. The point is that this second output of applying the cipher is more random, if we can say that, than the first application. And less of an obvious pattern in this case, using the same cipher, and leads to a more secure ciphertext. What we'd like is a ciphertext which is completely random. That is, uh, there's no pattern that can be observed by the, uh, by the attacker. The point is here that by applying the transposition twice, we've improved the security of the output ciphertext. And it's a concept that's applied in most ciphers today. Take some simple operation, rearrange these letters, and repeat it multiple times. So after the first application, maybe the output's not very secure, but after you apply it again, it's better, and again, and again, and again. It keeps mixing things up. And the more mixed up it is, the harder it is for the attacker to take the resulting ciphertext and work back and find the original plaintext. So this is an important concept that we use in in real ciphers. Apply simple operations multiple times. And similar with substitutions, not just with transpositions. So we've covered the two main techniques, substitution, transposition. Last one. What's the message? For those who haven't sat in my lecture before, what's the uh, plain text? Give you one or two minutes. Here's a message you receive. 
It has a hidden message. What is it? And then we'll come back and explain what we're doing in this one. There's a hidden message in there. It's a, in fact a real message, but there's some um, secret hidden. It's some real message between two professors or two, two people at a university, someone sending a greeting to George. Anyone want to have an attempt? What's the first word? Okay. Second word. Okay, he has the lecture notes from last year. He's got it. Anyone else? What's the message? We'll come back, give you a chance. Let's explain what we're doing. This is another, uh, a different thing than what we're going to cover in this course, steganography. This is the process of hiding a real message inside a fake but meaningful message. So what we do is I send some message that makes sense, not encrypted, so I send this letter to someone, but inside that real message, that inside that message that makes sense, I hide another secret message, one that I don't want other people to know. This is the process of steganography. And this assumes that the person who receives this message knows the method I'm using to hide the secret. And there are different examples of how to hide a secret in, in some other message. In the old days, for example, a written letter, you write a letter and you put small pinholes above the characters that make up your secret message and if you hold it up for the light or you hold it so you can see the pinholes, then you identify the characters and read off the secret message. Or some form of invisible ink where you write a normal message but something's marked such that there's some secret identified in there as well. We'll see in the next slide our, our secret message in a moment. Today, more practical, you send an image or a video across a network, say a JPEG, and you modify that JPEG a little bit such that some bits in the binary uh, representation of that, that image make up some hidden message. The output is that the, from the user's perspective it doesn't look like the image is any different from some original image. Some bits are changed, meaning maybe some pixels change in colour, but from the human eye it's hard to detect. But in fact there's some coded message included. And similar can be done with videos. This is not encryption, but we can use it for a similar purpose of hiding a secret and communicating between two entities. And the advantage of this compared to encryption is it doesn't look like you're hiding anything. I send someone a normal message from an attacker's or an observer's perspective, they cannot, it doesn't look like I'm communicating a secret to the other person. And that can be a benefit sometimes, for, for example, to, to avoid traffic analysis. The problem with steganography is that once the attacker knows how I'm hiding the messi message, they can find everything that I've sent in those messages. And it can be inefficient in that I need to send a large amount of information to get a short message from A to B. We're not going to cover steganography in this course, but it's an interesting thing for you to do uh, outside of the course. But we'll finish. Anyone else have the message? What's the secret? Well, George knows the procedure in this case. George knows when he receives this message. From an attacker's perspective, it just looks like a normal message or email or letter someone would send someone in a university. But George, the receiver, knows the method is to read the last word of each line. Try. The last word of each line.
Your package ready Friday 21st, room 3, please destroy this immediately. Chaos yours. Okay, so here's the secret message included inside this fake message. Of course, it, once you know that method, read the last word of each line, it's very easy to see. And it's very easy for the attacker to find it. But if you don't know the method, it's hard to find what that secret is. Again, steganography will not cover that anymore in this course. What's the best cipher we've got so far? Which cipher is the most secure? I've gone through Caesar, Monoalphabetic, uh, Playfair, Visionaire, One Time Pad, Rail Fence, Rose Columns. They'll all be in your quiz online and all be in your quiz next week uh, in, in the lecture. Which one's the best of those seven? One time pad is the best. Um, best in terms of security, okay? Uh, so it's the most secure. And in fact, it's the most secure cipher that we know of. We saw the one time pad, we applied the Caesar cipher, changing that the, the uh, assuming we had a random key as long as the input plaintext. You can implement the one time pad in practice as an exclusive OR. Let's move from English to uh, computing. And instead of A to Z, we'll look at zeros and ones, binary. I don't think you have this one, sorry, but uh, let's, you don't need it, it's just an example. Uh, no need to copy it down. Let's just have a quick look and just demonstrate that, okay, I want to send a message. So this is actually an example of a brute force attack, but that's not so important. I have a message, hello, I want to send that to someone. Well, we represent that in binary. So how do we do that? We can use an ASCII conversion where we do a look up and see the, upper, the letter uppercase H converts to some 7-bit value. And I've done that. And it turns out that uppercase H corresponds to 1001000. Now you look up in an ASCII table and it will tell you that. And similar for the others. So we can treat any message as binary. And we'll do so when we look at our ciphers from now on. Zeros and ones. Uh, and a second example, okay, let's say we have the message Steve is what we want to send. Then here's the binary form of, of the four letters and of course E is repeated at the end. So in decimal from the ASCII table and the binary form. So Steve can be represented as a, what, a 7 by 5, 35 bit plain text value. So now, from now on, we're going to deal in binary for our ciphers, not with uh, English characters. One uh, operation that we can use to encrypt, and it becomes, in fact, the one-time pad, is to take our plain text and apply the exclusive OR operation. Take the plain text input and exclusive OR with a key. And it's the same as the one-time pad that we saw where we take our plain text as a set of letters and apply the Caesar cipher where our key is as long as the plain text. If our key is as long as the plain text and random, just applying the exclusive OR between the plain text and the uh, key, and I, I will not show the example yet, the plain text and a key is the same length as, a, as the plain text will give us ciphertext which is perfectly secure. There will be no way for the attacker to take that ciphertext and determine the correct key, nor uh, do a brute force attack. So exclusive OR is a way to implement a one-time pad. Everyone remember exclusive OR? Zero, XOR zero, 
0, XOR 1, 1, XOR 0, 1, XOR 1. When they are different, 1 is the answer. When they are the same, 0 is the answer. 0, XOR 0 is 0, for example. We're going to see XOR used and some other operations used when we look at our real cycles. So just a warning. Let's treat everything as binary from now on. So let's look at some real, or a real cipher, and the first, generally, the concepts of block ciphers, the principles. Sorry. So we're going to talk about block ciphers, but first we need to define what do we mean by a block cipher. Well, there's an alternative, a stream cipher. And we distinguish sometimes between stream ciphers and block ciphers. And the main difference is on how much of plain text do they operate on at a time. Stream cipher typically operates and encrypts one bit, or more commonly one byte at a time. Block cipher usually encrypts, say, 64 bits or 128 bits at a time. We'll see some examples. We'll, we'll not cover much of stream ciphers yet. We'll see an example later. Uh, stream ciphers normally use some plain, take some plain text as input and generate some random sequence of bits and apply the XOR operation, exclusive OR, between that random sequence of bits and the plain text and get our cipher text. So stream ciphers usually use exclusive OR. And the complexity of stream ciphers is in generating a random sequence of bits. So we'll return to that later when we look at random numbers. How do we gener generate them? The one-time pad is an example of a stream cipher. Assuming we have a random, a long random sequence of bits, that's our key, simply XOR with the plain text, and you get your cipher text. Block ciphers operate on some block of plain text at a time. Typically 64 or 128 bits in most ciphers we'll see. We take the input bits and apply some encryption algorithm and we'll see that usually much more complex than just uh, an exclusive OR and we get our ciphertext as output. And of course that encryption algorithm takes a key as input. We're going to focus on block ciphers for now. We'll return to stream ciphers later and discuss the differences. So some characteristics of block ciphers. In fact, this is a characteristic of any cipher. But we need uh, reversible mappings. What a cipher does is take some plain text and produces cipher text. So it maps the plain text bits to a set of ciphertext bits, perform some mapping. These bits become these other bits. Reversible means that we must be able to successfully decrypt. If we have some mapping as defined in this table where we have two bits of plain text at a time, a block size of two bits, and we define the mapping that if we encrypt 0, 0, we get 1, 1 as an output. If we encrypt 0, 1, we get 1, 0, 1, 0 maps to 0, 0, 1, 1 maps to 0, 1. Then this mapping is reversible. Because if we take our cipher text, we can get the original plain text back. If my plain cipher text, if my cipher text is 1, 1, then I know for sure the plain text is 0, 0. Because we have a one to one mapping. The table on the right here is an example of an irreversible mapping. If I encrypt plain text 0, 0, I get 1, 1. 0, 1 maps to 1, 0. 1, 0 to 0, 1. 1, 1 to 0, 1. Now, I receive some ciphertext. I receive the ciphertext 0, 1. What's the plain text? If I receive 0, 1, I need to decrypt and get the original plain text back, but I cannot do it 
because if I have ciphertext 01, I don't know whether the original plain text was 10 or 11. So it's not a reversible mapping. We cannot do the opposite uh, mapping. So we must have a one-to-one -one mapping between plain text and ciphertext. The plain text cannot map to a different plain text cannot map to the same value ciphertext. That's the, the principle there. Otherwise we cannot decrypt. So let's look at let's look at a cipher and, and then talk about a block ideal block cipher. you have the one I'm about to show. It's an example of an ideal block cipher. You have this in your lecture notes. We'll start with a very simple block cipher that we'll treat it as a mapping and it maps two bits of plain text to a set of possible ciphertext values. So if you find this one, I'll show just the mapping and explain it on, on, on the screen. Let's say our block size is two bits. That means what we do when we, we have a plain text message to send, let's assume we have a cipher that encrypts two bits at a time. Okay, we take two bits of plain text, encrypt, and get two bits of ciphertext. Then we take the next two bits of plain text and get two more bits of ciphertext, and we keep doing so. That's our encryption approach. So we can think of the cipher as mapping two bits of plain text to two bits of ciphertext. What this diagram, and it's from the, the printout you have, it shows all possible mappings for every two bits of plain text given 24 different keys. So we have a two bit block in this example. That means our plain text and our cipher text will be two bits long. If our plain text is longer, we separate it into blocks. So what this diagram is showing is that if we just look at the top, if my plain text is 0, 0, and if I use key 1, then the cipher text will be 0, 0 as an output. That's one mapping. Using the same key, key 1, plain text 0, 1, output is 0, 1. And 1, 0 goes to 1, 0, 1, 1 to 1, 1. There's one mapping using a particular key. So, how many possible plain text values do we have? We see there are 2 to the power of 2 possible input plain text. This is, I think, on your handout with a 2-bit block cipher, the set of plain text values we can have is 4 to the power of 2. And we've listed them uh, in the first column. And our cipher maps plain text bits to cipher text bits. How many possible mappings do we have? And the answer is in front of you, it's on the screen. Well, there are 24 possible mappings. They're all listed here. So the first 12 are on the top and the second 12 underneath that. There are 24 possible mappings from those four plain text values to uh, reversible mappings to ciphertext values. Why 24? What's the equation? How do we get 24? Four factorial. There are four factorial is 24 in this case. We have four inputs. 
we can rearrange them in how many ways? Well, you can check and see that this this all 24 possible rearrangements of them. 4 by 3 by 2 by 1, uh, 24 or 4 factorial arrangements or combinations. So if you look at the first column at the top, you'll see that's a one arrangement of those four values. And so this is one of the arrangements and with K2 that's a different arrangement and so on. So we have a total of 24 possible different arrangements of those four values. And they are our possible mappings from plain text to ciphertext. What arrangement do we use to encrypt? Well, that is the key. That is the key for our cipher. So this is a, a definition or this is an example of a ideal block cipher. So how it works is we take some plain text as input and we encrypt and produce a ciphertext as output where the input to the encryption is also a key. That's our normal operation. For example, plain text 0, 1. The encryption is defined by this, all of this data here. Plain text 0, 1, okay, we find the plain text value, and then the key determines which mapping do we use of those 24 possible mappings. So if, for example, we have a key of, uh, if we choose a key of uh, K17, for example, K17. Mapping 17 in our list. What's the ciphertext? Well, plain text 01. Plain text 01, the third row. Key 17, mapping number 17. The output will be 00, zero as the ciphertext. Plain text, sorry, plain text is 0, 1. Let's try that again. Plain text is the second row, 0, 1. Key 17, output 0, 1. Key 17, plain text. 0, 1, output 0, 1 for this case. So here's a cipher. What we do is we take all possible plain text values and define all possible mappings or all possible arrangements of those plain text values. And the key determines which arrangement we use to determine the cipher text. This is what we call an ideal block cipher. We can implement any block cipher like this. How big is the key? What is the key length in this case? Or how, what is the key? I said key K17. Well, the key tells us which mapping to use. So K17 means use mapping number 17. So what the, the source does, the source that has the plain text, they have this table, these tables. They define the mappings, all possible mappings, and they take their plain text and they choose the secret key and they get their ciphertext. They send the ciphertext to the recipient the recipient must have the same set of tables to decrypt. 
but in fact the key can tell us the mapping to use. K17 we could write as those 8 bits. Which 8 bits? These 8 bits. A17 we can say is 11, 01, 02, 03, 10. How that works is that we read this, so this is meaning, okay, 0, the plain text 00, zero maps to this value. Plain text 01 maps to the second value, plain text 10 maps to the third, and plain text 11 maps to the fourth value. So in order of the plain text. So if this is the key, what we do now is that the, the source chooses the key, that is this specific mapping, they encrypt and they get 01 as the output, they send 01 to the recipient. If the recipient also knows this key, then what do they get as the output? Well, they receive ciphertext 01, which is in the second position of the key, and therefore the plain text is 01 of output, because it's right at In blue we have our cipher text, and in red the plain text. The key is the blue value, and this is just the values in order. So we always write these in order. So if the recipient receives 01 from the key, they know that 01 goes to 01. If the recipient received 10 as the ciphertext, they know the plain text is 11. If they receive 11, they know the plain text is 00. Okay. So the, the key in this case defines the mapping. This is an ideal block cipher in that we can implement any block cipher just as this mapping from plain text values to its ciphertext. The problem with using this is that it's pr impractical to, to implement. Let's return to our slides for a moment. An ideal block cipher, we take an n bit input, n bit plain text, and that can map to 2 to the power of n possible states, we can think of them. So we had our 2 bit plain text, we got 4 possible plain text inputs to the power of 2. And we do some substitution. We take the input and replace it with one of the other possible values, uh, one other, one possible value. So there are 2 to the power of n possible outputs, which map back to a 2-bit a input, a 2-bit output, getting confused. This allows for all possible combinations of plain text to ciphertext mappings. And another example, the one that was we saw, another example is shown on this slide, but maybe better to show just as these tables. Just one other example, where here's a mapping from, on the left-hand table, the encryption table, these 16 plaintext values can map to these 16 ciphertext values. That's one possible mapping. In this cipher, how many mappings are there in total? How many possible mappings? We saw in our previous example we had 24 possible mappings. 24 possible keys. Here I've shown just one mapping for a different cipher. How many possible in total? How many 
possible mappings. If you want to find the answer, maybe start writing them all out. It'll take you a long time though. But just focus on the left table, the other ones are decryption. Let's go back to our, sorry, wrong direction. Our first example, we had a two-bit block. Two bits of plain text. Gives us four possible plain text values. 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1. And how many arrangements of those four values can we have? How many different ways can we arrange them? All of these 24 values are there the possible arrangements. There are 24 or 4 factorial arrangements, combinations. So with this was a 2-bit block cipher, what about with our other cipher? How many possible mappings? Sixteen factorial. Why? is a 4-bit block cipher, plain text, 4 bits. How many possible plain text values are there? 16, they're listed here, 2 to the power of 4. 16 possible plain text. I challenge you to go and write those 16 values, or if you want to do it in decimal rather than binary, write the values 0 to 15, and then try an arrangement, arrange them in different orders. See how many different arrangements you can make and it'll be 16 factorial, which is what? Uh, I don't know, calculator? How many arrangements? We have a 4-bit block cipher, so 2 to the power of 4 possible plain text. 16 factorial possible arrangements. Again, 16 factorial to 20 trillion different arrangements. Okay, so you go and write them all, all down, and that's how many possible arrangements we have in that case. Maybe that should be the penalty for those uh, who cannot answer the quiz in the next lecture. Anyone who gets less than 50% has to write them all down. Sounds okay? Doesn't sound that hard to write tw 20 trillion different arrangements? Oh, okay, all right. So, so the point is that this is just one of those 20 trillion different arrangements. We have many others. Which arrangement do we use to encrypt? This is one. Well, the one that we use is defined by the key. How long is our key in this case? What is the key? And go back to our easier example where we have just 24 arrangements. We have a 2-bit block cipher, 24 possible arrangements. The key de determines the arrangement we're using. For example, key 17 was, tells us the order in which our plain text values map to our cipher text. So we could write the key, key 17, as, in fact, 11010010, 8 bits. And the way that we interpret the key is that, is that since we know it's a two-bit block cipher, we know that okay, the first two bits in the key map to 0, 0. The second two bits map to 0, 1. The third two, 1, 0, and the last two to 1, 1. So in that case, we could represent the key as 8 bits. How big is our key with our other cipher. In this case. 
Well, the key would be all of these values. What we would send, or what we could store as the key, is 1110. So every four bits identify the ciphertext for the in order plaintext. So 4 by 16 or 64 bits would be the length of the key in this case. Because if we know the key, if we know these 64 bits and store them in order, when I receive ciphertext 1010 from the key, I can determine, well, that's in the, what is it, in the ninth position, and therefore it maps to decimal 9 or binary 1001. So we could use a key in that way. So the key in this case in general is how big? This is with 4 bits. We have 4 by 16. With a 4 bit block cipher, 4 by 16. Or an n bit block cipher, n by 2 to the power of n. 4 by 16. 4 by 2 to the power of 4 is the key length. In, in bits in this case. So what? Yeah. The key tells us the mapping. Let's go back to our simple, simpler one. Go the wrong way. Twenty-four mappings. Okay. And we let let's keep it simple. But which mapping? In which order do we do these mappings? We need to define that. Yeah. The key length. Uh, yes, correct. What did I say? Uh, sorry, n, n times 2 to the power of n. Correct. So in our case, 64. 4 by 2 to the power of 4. Yeah. So in this case, we have a block size of 2 bits, n equals to 2. The key is 2 times 2 to the power of 2, or 8 bits. That is, these 8 bits is key 17. If I want to encrypt using a different mapping, for example, key 13, then I could set the key to be 01100011. And when the receiver receives the ciphertext 00, if they know this key, from the key they determine that the plain text is 10. But that leads to our problem with this ideal block cipher. Let's say we have a large block size. N, for example, is 64, 64 bits. So we've seen an example of a block of 2 bits, a block of 4 bits. Let's say we have a block of 64 bits, which we'll see is typical. Then the key length is 64 times 2 to the power of 64 bits, which is too large, because it's too large to be able to distribute to someone. It's too hard to, to write down and, and to, to record. And it becomes very hard to implement when you have such large uh, values. So using a large block size is, it, is not possible if we use such a cipher. Using a small block size, therefore, makes the key more manageable. But it turns out the smaller the block, if we have a typically large plain text, we have more blocks, and it becomes much easier to perform an attack by using the stati statistical characteristics of the plain text. So we have a problem. We can't use a small block size because it makes attacks easier based on st statistical analysis. But we can't use a large block size because it makes the key too large. So we need some alternative approach. So an ideal block cipher allows all possible mappings. Real block ciphers today do not use this approach. They only allow a select number of mappings. But they make the trade-off of being able to use a large block by keeping the key small. And there are different ways of doing it.
And there was one, there's one common approach that was devised by a, a guy called Feistel. The approach in general is to use simple ciphers, smaller blocks, but apply them multiple times and in some structured manner to make the output cryptographically strong. So to use two or more simple ciphers, but repeat one after another. And, and that's the concept that we started to introduce with our classical ciphers. By repeating the same simple cipher, we can get more strength in the output cipher text. And what did we have? We had in our ideal cipher, and let's write it down, with our ideal cipher, we said with an n bit block, n bit block size. How many transformations or mappings did we have? We had 2 to the power of n factorial transformations or mappings, which is good. We want as many as possible. But the key, key length, becomes n times 2 to the power of n which is bad because if n is large that key length becomes too large if n is n is 10 for example then this is a thousand times 10 this 10,000 bits is the key length La it's bad because of the management problem for the key distributing the key with a Feistel block cipher, it makes a trade-off. We have an n-bit block size, and the mappings is not determined by the block size, but by the key length. With, we also define a k-bit key, so we set the key length, and the number of mappings depends upon the key length. So. key length is k bits, the number of mappings is 2 to the power of k. Which is this trade-off of, we, drew, we reduce the number of mappings in practice. Uh, let's say n and k are the same length, with an ideal block cipher, we have 2 to the power of n factorial mappings, which is much, much more than just 2 to the power of n, if n and k are the same. So we reduce the number of mappings, but we have a manageable key length, k bits. So if we define k as 64, say, 64 bits, we have 2 to the power of 64 possible mappings. Uh, but we have a manageable key length. If we have a 64-bit block with an ideal cipher, the key length is 2 to the power of 64, uh, 2 to the, yeah, 2 to the power of 64 times 64, which is just too large. Here it's just 64 bits. So Faisal structure allows us a much more manageable size in the key length. But by rep repeating the simple encryption operations provides almost equal security as what an ideal block cipher and sufficient security. The picture on the next slide shows the structure, actually the next one. We will not go into much detail because we'll see it in DES. Uh, it repeats the general design of a cipher. It's not a specific cipher, it's a general design. And it breaks uh, the cipher into a set of rounds. A round is the same each time, the same algorithm. 
we just repeat this algorithm multiple times or multiple rounds. And it involves splitting the plain text into left and right halves. So if we have a 64-bit plain text, we break it into two 32-bit portions. Swapping the halves, we'll see some different operations like swapping the halves, using an exclusive OR and applying some function and he generalized that some function will see some specific instances. And a key is an input, and repeating, and repeat, and repeat, as, as per how many rounds we have. So we'll come back to that when we see deaths, because it's an example of a Feistel structure. But the concepts, there's an alter alternation between substitutions and transpositions. So coming back to our classical ciphers, we're using these basic operations. Replacing and rearranging. Substitution is replacing, transposition is rearranging, or permutations. And we'll see shortly that we talk about S operations and P. P for permutation is commonly used. P operations. And applies the concepts of diffusion and confusion. Anyone understand confusion? I think everyone's experts, because many people look confused. We will look and come back to these concepts of what do we mean by dif diffusion and confusion with respect to ciphers. But let's move on from some of the abstract concepts and, and look at some specific examples. We'll come back to them ne next lecture. Let's go to DES, and then we'll see a few examples before going through the details. The data encryption standard. It was probably, it would maybe still is, the, it was the most widely used cipher in the world, symmetric block cipher. It was developed about 40 years ago, okay, designed by people at uh, uh, IBM, and NSA apparently had input and it was standardized by what was then called NBS, but is now called the National Institute of Standards and Technology, NIST. So a US standards organization created the standard for DES. And the idea was that when this organization creates the standard, all the US government departments must use that for encryption. And because the US government is using it for encryption, many companies use it for encryption, and not just in the US, outside. And it's spread across the world in that DES become effectively a worldwide standard for encryption. A symmetric block cipher, it operates on a 64-bit input block. So to encrypt, we take 64 bits of plain text and we produce 64 bits output. So we produce 64-bit ciphertext. What if my plain text is larger than 64 bits? Well, we break our plain text into blocks of 64 bits in length, encrypt them one at a time, and then we've got different ways of combining those output ciphertext together. And the next topic we'll talk about how to combine them, modes of operation. So DES just looks at 64 bits at a time. It has a 64-bit key, but we'll see when we look at the details that only 56 bits of, that, of those 64 were actually used in the encryption. The other 8 bits were used as a parity check. So a parity check to check if there's any errors. So from a security perspective, it's effectively a 56-bit key. How long does our brute force take against 64 bits? A 56 bits brute force. Worst case, we need to do a brute force of 2 to the power of 56 operations. If you go back to the last set of lecture notes, what, days, hours, seconds, if we have ultra-fast machines. From a key length perspective, it's insecure. It's too short nowadays. But in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, it was OK. But now it's, it's not OK. The principles used in DES have been applied in other ciphers. So the, to overcome the short key length, there were improvements like triple DES. And they uh, are still in use today. So the principles used are, are used, we'll see in other ciphers. 
what we're going to do, and we'll not go through the details today, but in the next lecture, we're going to go through the details of how DES works. But because it's quite complex, what I'll use is take a cut down version. It works on 64 bits. I cannot write 64 bits on the board and do an operation on it. It takes too long. So some people have developed one for teaching called Simplified Desk, which will cut things down to smaller chunks, smaller sizes, 8 bits, 10 bits. And we'll go through one example to show the operations. Uh, it's not a real cipher, it's just for teaching. But we'll go through that next week. So we'll go through simplified DES as an example, and then we'll look at, well, real DES, and look at the details, and some of the design issues and, and possible attacks on real DES. To finish today, I want to move on and look at some software that we can use for encryption. Uh, I know we've talked about a lot of uh, concepts today, so let's look at some practice. First, let's remind you what your uh, homework tasks are. You have a quiz to do before the lecture next week. Okay, you must do the quiz. And there's a new exercise that I've added. But the exercise is not marked or anything. And you should only do the exercise if you understand from the quiz. Okay, I've just added it today. Uh, don't, is, you don't have to do it. It may just help you with understanding some of the, the more advanced concepts. But before I talk about the exercise, uh, I've mentioned before, and I also pointed on the website, there are some, that's the wrong one, I've written up some examples using classical ciphers and attacking classic, classical ciphers. So in this web page, and you've got a printout, described how to do a brute force, and more importantly, how to do frequency analysis attacks on very simple classical sites. I recommend you read that and understand that. Because if you can understand how the attacks can be performed, then you understand the limitations and, and approaches for your attacks on real sites. And there's another one about the one-time pad. So I recommend reading that and looking at the example to see, well, why is the one-time pad unbreakable? Why does it provide perfect security? If you don't understand, then, then have a read through this. And it talks about, with an example, why even a brute force attack on the one-time pad will be unsuccessful. So read them. Coming back, exercise one. Only do this if you are OK with all the other concepts so far, because it can be time consuming. Quite simple. Here's some ciphertext find the plain text or key. Okay. I give you, I think there's four different ciphertext values. For example, this. I give you a hint. All right. Caesar cipher was used. Find the key. Find the plain, te plain text and key. Some are easy. The first one should be easy. Second one, here's some ciphertext. Braille fence was used. Find the key. Then we'll find the plain text. And I think that one's easy. Most people can do that. Three. Some ciphertext. Rose columns was used. This takes a little bit of thinking and a bit of trial and error to break that one. Okay, maybe you could write some software to automate it. But you can do it on paper as well, that one. Those you can do it on paper. You can do it with software, fine. But uh, what I don't suggest is find some website that solves it for you. No point. But I. I if you want to write software or use a spreadsheet or, or some, some scripting language to automate the tasks, for sure, recommend it. And especially for the last one, ciphertext 4, monoalphabetic cipher was used, using English only, so the key length is 26 characters, effectively randomly arranged. Here's the ciphertext, find the plain text. I think most people can do one and two quite easily. Three and four take a bit more time and thinking. But if you can do them, then you probably fully understand both how the ciphers work and how the attacks work.
let's move to real ciphers for the last five, five minutes or so. Another printout I've provided you and on the website here is, well, let's use some software to encrypt. Once we go through DES, let's encrypt something with DES. So you can get different software implementations of many of the ciphers that we, we talk about. One common open source uh, library and application for encryption is OpenSSL. And we'll use it for demos and examples throughout the course, OpenSSL. It provides a command line interface. It's in, usually on available for most Linux and, and Mac uh, operating systems already installed. I'll just quickly show some examples. So this web page describes how to use it. Let's look at a few examples of how to use it. Let's encrypt some data. First, let's encrypt some plain text. And I'll take a plain text file, for example. OK, so I've created a plain text file, which is just some text message. Hello, this is our super secret message. Keep it secret. Uh, let's encrypt it using OpenSSL. And yet, let's, uh, we'll choose a cipher as we go. different ways of doing it. First, let's find some details about our plain text. Sorry. How long is the plain text? I have a piece of software word count. It tells me it's 72 characters long. Okay, let's start with that. It's 72 characters. In fact, it's 72 bytes. One character is one byte. If we look at our plain text.txt file, it's 72 bytes. So we're going to encrypt a 72 byte plain text. Uh, I have to have a look at the details in maybe hexadecimal. Everything I'm doing is on the website on those instructions. So I would not explain too much, just do the steps. So that's our message. So this is the ASCII, this is the hexadecimal. Remember, our ASCII maps back to binary. Or we can represent that binary as hexadecimal values. So H-E-L-L-O uh, dot space T is in fact represented as these hexadecimal digits. Or even nicer, binary. Yeah, hard to see. Do it again. Harder to see. Okay. Of course, I don't expect you to, to read this, but this is H-E-L-L-O, uh, where did we get? O dot space T. Okay. So just a binary representation. So when we're applying our rule cipher, we're actually operating on the binary form. Okay. When we apply DES, AES, and others, we take the binary values and apply our cipher on those binary values. But of course, hard, hard to uh, show the binary values sometimes. So let's encrypt. And I'll encrypt using DES, but we need a key. Okay. I need to encrypt with some key. And with DES, we have a 64-bit key, although we only use 56. We need to specify a 64-bit key. Uh, it turns out with the software we can use, we can use hexadecimal. I don't have to I can write in binary 64 bits or 16 hexadecimal digits. Anyone suggest a key for me? 64 bit value or 16 hexadecimal digits? Well, it's best to choose a random key. Remember, a key should be such that, it should be secret, so I shouldn't tell you, but it should be such that no one can guess it. If I choose a key of all zeros, well, an attacker could just try all zeros, and uh, uh, it's not very sensible to choose that. Value. So, ideally, your key should be generated randomly. 
You should not choose it. You should let a computer generate it for you. So generate some random number. Different ways to generate random numbers. Uh, the program that we're going to use to encrypt is called OpenSSL. And it includes many different encryption operations, including random number generation. It has an operation to generate a random number, eight hexadecimal, uh, eight bytes in hexadecimal. That's what we're saying here. There it is. So what I did is generate an eight byte random number and output in hexadecimal, and that's the value. Sorry if we lose a little bit, but make sure you can see it. Again. Uh, we haven't explained it yet, but it turns out to encrypt we need a key and some initial value. And I'm going to use some random initial value. But let's encrypt. And we use OpenSSL. We say we want to encrypt with a symmetric cipher. What cipher? DES. And in the next topic, we'll see that ECB means something, electronic code book, but not so important yet. But DES, ECB, encrypt, minus E, input, plain text, file, output, cipher text, dot, E and C, whatever extension I like, it's not so important. Input key, my random value. So use my key to encrypt. And we need some initial value. Let's not explain that yet, but we'll need that. Uh, and I'll choose this other random number for an initial value. And sometimes our cipher, when our text is not of a particular length, will pad, pad the plain text. I don't want to do any padding here. Uh, it's not necessary, so I'm going to specify an option to not pad, no pad. And done, we encrypted. Okay, so you don't have to remember all these operations, I'm uh, just giving you an, an example. And we have our ciphertext, which is 72 bytes long. That's our ciphertext. Let's look at the ciphertext now. There it is. Okay. There's our ciphertext. From encrypting our message, hello, uh, this is a super secret message, here's our ciphertext. And as you see, it's just a random set of, these are hexadecimal digits. There's no meaning in ASCII, so it doesn't make sense to look at this from a text file perspective, because we get any of those uh, uh, ASCII characters. The dots mean unprintable. And we could look at in binary as well, but I will not show you in binary. To binary. So we've encrypted using uh, OpenSSL. You can do that on any file. It doesn't have to be a text file. It can be an image. It can be a Word document. Uh, any file you like, because OpenSSL SSL just treats it in its binary form, as zeros and ones. And to finish, of course, let's decrypt. And decrypt is almost the same as encrypt. So I'll almost repeat the command. Instead of minus E, what do we have? Minus D to decrypt. And the input is, of course, the ciphertext. And the output is some file, let's say it's my uh, received message. Same key, we need to decrypt with the same key as we encrypted with and the same initial value. Okay. And let's look at our receive message. And it should be the same as our plain text message. Yes. Okay. So we decrypted successfully. That's all. Our receive message, which was output from the decryption, is identical to the original plain text, which was the input to the encryption. So, just a taster. Become experts in OpenSSL because you use that, you may use that in your homeworks and you'll use it in practice in the future to encrypt 
data. So have a look on some of the websites to see how OpenSSL works and start to use it, uh, especially as we go through the real science. Enough for today. To next week we'll look at the details of DES by going through simplified DES.